Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, workshop, um, Wrangling Arrays with D-Type Next. Um, so I, I think that uh, I'll just jump in and then, I, but I just want to make sure uh, that everyone um, feels uh, uh, free um, and, um, um, you know, licensed to interrupt me with questions, uh, either by putting a message in the Zulip chat or, uh, you know, unmuting and saying, hey. Um, uh, especially the beginning of the talk has some conceptual stuff that we'll try to get through and that I think may be good to make sure everyone's kind of understanding um, and is on the same page about. Uh, so I'm gonna start by sharing my screen. Um, let's see. Yeah, okay. You guys see my screen? Uh, yes. Okay, good. So yeah, the title of the workshop is Wrangling Arrays with D-Type Next. And um, it's a workshop I developed with uh, David Sletton. Um, we've been giving it alternately uh, in the, over the past month as part of the, um, uh, this, you know, the lead up to the Reclosure Conference, which has a uh, data science focus this year. Um, so um, just to get started, uh, a little bit of um, uh, just business. There's a link here, which we can also post in the Zulip chat that goes to a, a, a template repository. So this is GitHub has a feature where you can identify a certain uh, repository as a template, which means that you can click this use this template button and, and then kind of essentially copy the repository into your own account. Uh, and then work on it. Uh, so we'll, you know, inside this repository, we have um, just a few things which I'll try to show. Can you guys see the repository screen here? Uh, anyone say, want to give me an affirmative that you're actually seeing this? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. <laughs> Good. Okay. So in, in, nothing too complicated here. Oh, sorry, say that again. Sorry, you said that you have a template code available we can access the link. Can somebody post it in the Zurich? Yes, I'll post it right now. Uh, Thank you. Oops, I'll move this awkward box. There we go. Okay. So uh, this basically just is a resource for you. It will hold, it holds. Um, uh, a few simple things include uh, uh, a simple, you know, it basically has the dependencies you need you need to get started. Well, it's really just this one line with D-Type Next uh, if you want to play around. It and then it has the, the code that we're going to go over today in this workshop directory in the main. So that's what we're going to, we're going to be looking at this file most of the time today. Um, uh, and then it just has, you know, a few, you know, some additional stuff like exercise, suggest exercise that we'll come back to it towards the end today. Um, but that, yeah, that's just, uh, you know, it's not not a whole lot, but gets you going a little bit. Um, um, and has the examples that we'll go through. Uh, I'm going to get back to the thing here. So, um, yeah, right. Okay, so um, just to get started, I want to go through the, you know, what's our goal for the workshop today. Uh, uh, by the end of the workshop, you should know uh, more or less what D-Type Next is. Uh, you, you should have a sense of its role in the data science ecosystem that's emerging for closure. Uh, you should have a sense of why it's useful. And then may, most importantly, have a grasp of its key concepts uh, so that you know, can work with this library uh, effectively. Um, uh, and, and then have some simple be familiar with some simple examples of, it, of, uh, of how, how it's used. What we're not going to do today is go deeply into any sort of real world example, uh, although we'll kind of look at some data. Um, a lot of the examples here are, are hyper simple, uh, and that's uh, so to emphasize the, uh, you know, sort of not distract from the conceptual um, background that I'm trying to clarify here. And, and there's a reason for that, uh, which I think uh, so 
become clear is I, I think that uh, working with D-Type Next requires a bit of, um, uh, you, you know, awareness of some of these concepts in order to use it without confusion. Uh, and, and that's because um, it's kind of low level as we'll talk about in a second. So what is uh, D-Type Next? Uh, one, one way to summarize it in a nutshell is it's a low level library for efficiently efficiently processing sequences of typed entities. Uh, and, it, and it's rather abstract. Uh, what that means uh, when I say it's abstract will become clear, I think, through the workshop. Um, but, but generally speaking, um, it, 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 it's conceptually abstract. It, has, it, it offers some concepts for holding um, and, and working with typed sequences of data. Uh, and because it's abstract, uh, it you know it behaves in ways that are different depending on how how you're using it, what type of data you're working with, and um, uh, and so that's kind of one of the reasons that it, it's sort of low level and can be a little bit more challenging to work with than than some others. Uh, it, it's also fair to compare D-type next to, um, and, and you'll often hear this to NumPy. Uh, so in the Python world, you have you know, uh, um, a library called NumPy that's commonly used for array processing. And that, uh, and so sometimes people comp compare D-type next to NumPy. Um, and, uh, and that's an, a, a fair comparison, although there are big differences as we'll see. Uh, um, I think also at this stage, it's good to um, look at the actual repository, which is of course housed in its authors, uh, account. So the author of the library is Chris Nuremberger, who has really been instrumental uh, and, you know, kind of trans done a lot of transformative work making, um, uh, giving us the tools to do efficient data processing and closure. Um, uh, so let's take a look at the repository quickly, because I think that can be interesting. So here it is. Uh, always good to know where things are. Um, here it is. It's, uh, it's, um, uh, uh, in Chris's account, and it is, I, I think one thing we can do is kind of look at these first few sentences. Let me just uh, zoom that in a bit so it's not so small. Um, so um, Chris describes this library as a providing a unified pathway for dealing with contiguous containers of primitive data types, such as ints um, and floats. And then he goes on to say it defines the basis for array processing similar to what's found in APL or NumPy, as I was just explaining. So um, because this is a, a mouthful, I think it's also interesting to, uh, to think about uh, or to, to try to parse this a bit. Uh, what, it, what, a, what does people think is meant by contiguous containers of primitive data types? What's what's the what are the kind of interesting parts of that expression? Well, for Anyone? my own, yeah, my my uh, intuition tells me that it's uh, what well, I read a little bit to to be uh, fully transparent. Uh, uh, it interfaces with the external libraries in a uh, in a way that uh, that is agreed to as in a uh, standard, basically. It adheres to a standard, for example, to be able to leverage very fast C libraries and others. And also probably uh, to, uh, that's, that would be also a question I, I was hoping it, it also would make uh, contiguous uh, array programming uh, even on a JVM even faster. And I would surmise it also allows parallel data updates in, in these arrays, maybe even better than the JVM does. That's basically my take on it. And I assume it's also geared towards, uh, obviously, machine learning and, and so forth. Yes. Yeah, so it's, it, there are several things you said there. Um, th this particular phrase, contiguous containers of primitive data types, I think it's what jumps out to me is that it's, it's talking about, uh, and I think I, uh, uh, you know, that word contiguous is particularly important. It's talking about storing data in a you know contiguously in memory which of course offers a lot of performance uh benefits um 
uh, you know, less overhead in terms of managing memory and that kind of stuff. So, uh, but you also, well, what's your name? Sorry, I, I just see you as sorry, JF. Uh, JF. Oh, okay, that's your name? Okay, JF. Yeah, JF Rompuy, sorry. <laughs> Say again? Uh, my full name is uh, Rompuy, JF, R-O-M-P-R-E. I don't know if it shows on my hand. But... Uh, okay. Well, uh, so, yeah, I mean, as you were saying, the um, uh, there's a lot of other stuff. It's interfacing, DTEP Next is interfacing with uh, primitives uh, in the Java world, right? So a lot of what it's doing is it's a kind of low level library that's managing how uh, uh, these these entities that are in, you know, that we're dealing with as sequence of sequence, type sequences are managed in, in and the JVM, and it's doing it. You're also right, and uh, Chris has a large, longer talk about this, where he goes into it in sort of more detail, in um, as part of the London Closurians. Um, it's on their YouTube. It, you know, I think it was about a couple months ago, or maybe a little more at this point. And it, you know, and one of the things he was doing was, in fact, trying to make Java fast, which uh, it it hasn't traditionally been seen as. Uh, um, and so we're not going to go into the the way he solved that problem, but it's uh, for this kind of an introductory workshop. It's good to know that that's kind of what this library is doing, um, and it's also why it's kind of a low level library. That it it you're you're kind of close to the metal in the sense of if the metal is kind of the interop with Java. Um, uh, so, so yeah, um, what else is interesting here? Uh, I think, you know, it provides a unified pathway. So I, th I think what, what he's saying there, I would guess is that um, we're, uh, what the library is trying to do is despite the fact that there's a lot of different things going on under the hood to deal with different types and et cetera in the, the most e efficient way, it's trying to provide a unified API pathway. So you don't have to kind of create different types of objects yourself to manage uh, different types of data. Um, uh, yeah, I think the other, you know, just also in terms of pointing out useful resources uh, from this repository, read me, there's, uh, the, there's these, the API documentation here, which gets you to kind of your standard closure documentation. Uh, and then there's these very interesting overview and cheat sheet uh, and these are, uh, you know, deeper reads as well, but full of conceptual detail about uh, about DTEP Next. So worth looking at. Um, all right, I'm going to jump back to the talk if I can. Wait, jump to the. Yeah, and then, and then there's like one other sort of su uh, summary that I like to share, uh, which is sort of which is my conception of of how of the two big things that this library is doing. Uh, and one of them is that it's providing a, a typing system uh, that makes certain types of things knowable and ensures that they're handled in the most efficient way possible. So DType Next kind of lives its own, in its own world of types. Uh, and we're going to see that in, more concrete, in a more concrete sense when we uh, start working through the code. Uh, and then secondly, and this is in some ways the focus of the talk, uh, is that it provides these uh, certain abstractions for holding, accessing, and interacting with sequences of typed entities. Um, so let me just go to the next slide if I can. There we go. Okay, took a while for some reason. Um, so yeah, one other uh, I mentioned at the beginning. You know, one of the goals of the uh, talk was just to give you a sense of DType Next place in the emerging closure data science ecosystem and. Uh, here again is why uh, is another reason why sometimes people compare DTYPE next to NumPy is that if, if there's a kind of um, stack of emerging tools for holding and manipulating uh, and processing data efficiently, and um, uh, it's it, that stack is comprised of three libraries, two of which uh, are Chris's, and one is uh, is a library by here Table Clock by uh, Tomas Zulia. I don't think I pronounced his last name correctly. Um, so I apologize for that. But uh, so as you can see, data type next is kind of at the, well, at the left, in the left here, but I, it's, you know, in terms of the arrows, it's at the bottom. And that's because it is providing, um, you know, a way to manage data at a kind of low level. 
And then, but it's used inside of TechML dataset, which in a way is a library that one would probably reach for more frequently than deep dive next because it uh, gives you a, a, a tabular, you know, a sort of table, a, a, a data frame as it's called in Python, or as we call it, a data set. Uh, and so, you know, it's often the kind of tool you use to hold, to load and manipulate data, but its columns are based on dtype next, as we'll see in the talk. Uh, and then table cloth finally is providing a kind of very uh, beautiful and consistent API on top of TechML dataset that's been in, um, inspired by uh, tidy, you know, things like dplyr within the tidyverse R uh, in R, the tidyverse um, pack set of packages. Um, uh, and I think also data, the closure library data.table. Um, but it, it's it's a little bit more user friendly. And so actually when you're first starting with this stuff, it's probably table cloth you'll work, you'll reach for. But one of the um, the values of this workshop is that um, even when you're working, say with table cloth, you frequently end up using namespaces and functional uh, tools, uh, functions that are available. Uh, in TechML dataset and dtype next, and having an awareness uh, of the fact that dtype next is what you're you've got kind of under the hood when you're working with a column is really helpful. Uh, and so uh, you know we'll make your you know if even if you're not reaching for dtype next itself for some uh, specific job, uh, this will be very helpful for you um, uh, as you work with TechML dataset or table clock. Uh, are there any questions so far? No? Okay. So if there are no questions, I will, I think now we can jump into the code. So I'm going to share a different screen. Okay. So I'm just going to move this. It's more central to me. Um, okay. So uh, yeah, we've gone through a portion of the introduction here. Um, uh, and now I'm going to kind of jump in to the code. Uh, and just um, in case anyone's wondering, so that I'm sort of in the sake, for the sake of transparency, now I'm inside of that, that repository that I sh showed earlier. And you, uh, you may recall, I, you know, had there was a dependency there in that project. So this is, a, you know, it's kind of, a, it's a line again project. Sorry, it's a closure. It's a tools depths project with, so it has a depths.edn, which is how you declare dependencies when using that. And then I'm working inside of Emacs. So I can, you know, I've run, I've connected this buffer to a CIDR REPL um, and, and that REPL is running in the background, but I can evaluate uh, expressions in the buffer. So that's what I'm, how I'm going to be working. Uh, I'd I say that. Because I'm, Yes. Uh, I, I just uh, tried to load that namespace and it's taking a long time. I probably the idea is to evaluate one statement at a time, right? One form at a time. Uh, I'm sorry, so I didn't hear the last part of what you said. I, I went to this very file you were looking at. Yes. And uh, I'm trying to compile it, but it's taking a long time. I guess it's because I should only evaluate one statement at a time. Um. It's hard to say for sure, but it there is a bit of so one of the things that tech so we are loading at the bottom TechML dataset and that library has a slower load time than most. Okay, uh, but I it shouldn't the, be taking a super long time. Oh, okay, uh, you just finished, but I, I had an error. I don't know if uh, there's ah, something okay. missing. Uh, the uh, statement at line seventy one, the form that ends with all data types invocation. Uh, gives me a java.lang unsupported operation exception. Oh yeah, that's kind of part of the, uh, that's a that's a didactic error. <laughs> oh, okay. Is there something I can so, do quickly to uh, fix it or? Well, I think we should, it, cause we'll kind of get to it as we go through Okay, I'm workshop. sorry, go ahead then, <laughs> sorry. But it's good you're, you're grabbing the code, I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, I probably technically should have uh, uh, like commented that or something. Um, 
Uh, but I, yeah, by the end of the workshop, you'll understand why that happened. Uh, so just to get started, um, I think it it also, you know, while we're looking at the code, it, it and this is a question that may have occurred to some of you, is why not just use closure data structures? Uh, and, and so just to get started, I want to, as a kind of argument for what, why DTYPE Next is, is useful, um, uh, I just want to do a quick kind of benchmark. Uh, so, uh, oops, yeah. so I'm going to evaluate this expression here, which is going to require uh, DTYPE Next. And that's, you know, the main um, require statement you often use is tech v3 data type as DTYPE. You know, obviously you can change it. This is a common way to alias it. Um, you might also wonder about the v3. There have been previous versions of uh, of this library. Uh, and um, in fact, you may have noticed that the library is called dtype next. And that's because it's kind of the next version of uh, the previous one, which was, I guess, v2. Uh, and and um, Actually, speaking of load times, one of the things that DTYPE Next or V3 did was really improve the load times uh, of the library. So it was already fast at runtime. It, this the, the V3 DTYPE or DTYPE Next increased the load time, uh, or, or sorry, decreased the load time. Uh, and then uh, this other this other namespace is actually incredibly important. I'm going to ask you to not pay attention to it too much for a second, but we'll come back to it later. Um, Anyway, so I'm evaluating this uh, form and loaded it. Okay, so now what we've got here is just a simple reduce over a range uh, or over a million items. We're just going to add them together. And um, oh, I need to open a little. Yeah, okay. So I've op on the bottom there is the actual repro because that's where you see the output for the quick bench. And it takes a little bit. So I'm just going to run this and it, it won't show up right away. <sighs> My hands are cold. It's very cold here near Seattle. Uh, not very, I shouldn't say very. It's, it's never very cold here. It's cold. Yeah, you should not say very when you have people from Minnesota. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what very cold is. <laughs> all relative, it's all relative. <laughs> okay, sorry, I had to jump in. <laughs> uh, okay, so this finished and it, it looks like it took, uh, if you look at the execution time here, it took 13 milliseconds. So that'll be our, you know, baseline for uh, basic closure um, uh, structures and functions. Uh, and so now here, what we're doing is, is something roughly equivalent. We have, again, a million items. Uh, and this time we're going to create something. We have used this uh, dtype reader to arrow reader function to create uh, what we're going to talk about in, in more depth in a second, a buffer, a D type next buffer, which is the key concept in D type next. And then we're going to we're going to sum it the same way, but we're going to use this special function from this functional namespace that we're going to end up talking about quite a bit. Uh, and so if I run this, um, you know, it of course is doing different things under the hood than the simple reduce. No, I'm not. Yeah, I did run it. Okay, uh, but that's kind of the point. Um, and we'll see in a second the difference. All right. Okay. So this took three seconds, three milliseconds. So you know, it, it's it's quite a bit of an improvement. Uh, I think I'm not actually sure why I saw 13 milliseconds. Uh, I usually see uh, like six for the first one, but this the second one was fast as usual. Maybe something else going on on my computer. Um, so uh, yeah. So the point here is that uh, closure data structures aren't particularly efficient. And you know, I don't think that should be a surprise to too many people. They're easy to work with, but um, and, they, and they work for many cases, but they, they have some inefficiencies that give us some convenience. Uh, and, and, you know, but when working with large amounts of data, uh, that can be a, uh, something that's um, a problem quickly. Uh, so, yeah, now now we're going to kind of get into the um, heart of the matter uh, and look at and focus on buffers, which are, as I said previously, the key concept in DTYPE Next. So what are DTYPE Next buffers? They have a certain set of properties. They are random access, they are countable, 
they're typed uh, and meaning they all all the elements of them have the same type and we we can know that type and the most perhaps most interestingly and curiously as we'll come to back to later they're lazy and non caching so let's look at let's look at this uh, these properties in practice uh, so I can build a buffer and here's one way of doing it and as I'll get to explain in a second, this probably isn't the way you'll do it most of the time. But we've got here, we're giving it a closure vector, and then we say we're going to treat that as a buffer. So, okay, so now we have a buffer, and let's look at it. Interestingly, it looks, at least when you print it out in the buffer, identical to a uh, closure vector. Uh, we can, it's random access. I can get, you know, some random element from it. Uh, and it's countable. I can, I can, I know how many items are in it. Uh, and uh, now let's see, since it looks the same when we, when we print it out, the way it prints, let's, let's look at what we've actually got here. So this is interesting. Uh, does anyone know what, what's going on here? Or want to venture a guess? Well, I, I guess it, uh, it creates uh, its own implementation of uh, uh, a type that's derived from a random access uh, type of interface, I guess, or protocol. Right, right. So it's def uh, uh, it's defining something on the fly, uh, uh, and and you're right. It this has to do with what kinds of protocols uh, it's implementing. So. Um, what we can do, yeah, and so that you know, maybe for people that are let find this more confusing, that that little one kind of hint about what's going on here is that reify at the end. So if you look in the closure core uh, for the function reify, you'll find that there's a function there that allows you to essentially uh, implement a protocol, some interface on the fly, uh, and and so. That's what's happening here. Is, is essentially, dtype next is, is building the, the type of buffer it needs at runtime. And we can actually kind of get a sense of what, you know, and, and this is again, part of what I meant by this being a very abstract library and a little bit lower level, right? So if we look at dtype next and we look, we can actually go and look at what a buffer is it's defined in Java. And you can see it's a, it's a simple interface. Um, and uh, as Jeff guessed, it's implementing things like the random access interface, but also list and sequential and iterable. And then it has a set of functions. And you can see some of these functions are about reading and some of them are about writing. So a buffer is a thing that implements the interfaces listed there and, the, and can read. And as we'll talk about in some cases, in some cases can also write different types of, of entities. Um, so, but, you know, a lot of this stuff, again, you know, this being kind of an introductory workshop, we're not delving into the implementation of this library, but rather just enough to show you, give you a sense of what's going on and then showing you how to work with it. So a lot of this stuff we don't really need to know, uh, right? Because dtype next allows us to work with it relatively through that unified pathway, unified API, as we talked about before, but we need to know how to know what things are. So there's a, some function, a, a few functions that are important to know that help us, you know, sift through that. And one is this data type function, uh, which uh, let's say we give it a standard closure vector. Oh, so it tells us in D type world, this is a, in a persistent vector. And it tells us that in the way that dtype next does that using keywords. So it identifies the type of this thing and then reports it in terms of keywords. Similarly, if we look at our buffer, it tells us we have a buffer. Um, and then in, we also can ask what's inside this buffer, what kind of thing? And it tells us that we have objects. And anyone know why it's saying object? Hmm. Uh, it's probably because of the, uh, the boxing of the uh, of the values. 
but exactly. uh, but yeah. I would have thought that it would not want to box or it would unbox. Right. Uh, it, for performance right. reasons. Yeah. Right. So uh, so yeah, the couple of different things in what you said there. Um, do you want to explain or attempt to explain what boxing is and why it's sure. coming up here? Yeah. Well, it, it's for the the the, the, the Java backed. Uh, uh, closure the, the closure on the JVM uh, does everything uh, in the background on the uh, on on the JVM. So it has to create objects, and by default it does boxing because that's what the JVM usually takes. Or or perhaps I'm wrong. Maybe it, uh, I know that uh, Java uses primitive types just as much uh, as boxed type. Which are basically objects wrapping around the primitive types. For example, there is a java.lang.integer uh, type that that uh, wraps an object around or class around the primitive int, int, int type in Java in the JVM. So I guess that closure by default only deals with uh, a boxed object to comply with the uh, I object interface of, uh, of the, the, the root object class of all uh, closure objects for for uh, for uh, uniformity right yeah i don't think i don't know if it's wrong, required though. but in so so a boxed entity and i actually am less familiar with java than uh, than it sounds like you are but in my mind when we don't know when we're not dealing with something like the primitive entity itself we have to put it inside some class so that we can interact with it in a way that you know, where it can sort of handle how we're going to interact with it. And when we don't know what the type is, then we box things because it could be anything. Uh, and so if you look up back here, when we created our buffer, there's no, we didn't specify any type. And, and again, here we come up against how this is kind of a low level library. You can, you can end up being non-performant if you don't, if you're not, if you use it the wrong way, uh, you can end up with a a a buffer that's that's untyped that's that that is you know then boxed and so you end up you know the, with this default type of object and interacting with it is less efficient. But thankfully, uh, we have this uh, we have an ability to to end up with typed entities. So a couple you know just a couple examples. Let's say we actually specifically start with a, you know, use, this is a closure function, int array. Uh, and uh, we, we create a buffer from that. Well, if we look at the type, we end up seeing it, that it's, it's identified as int, int 32 to be specific. Um, or, and this is kind of, um, and, and actually, interestingly, sorry, I forgot that this was an example was here, but this, some, there are still some holes in dtype next. So this, uh, uh, function is another function I actually didn't know of until recently that where you can create, you know, a, a typed vector. And, and in this case, uh, we get, a, we end up just getting objects. So D type next doesn't respond to the way in which vector of, def, def, you know, ends up typing, uh, the, the, the uh, data structure returns. Uh, and I think the reason for that is because it just hasn't been a lot of need for this particular pathway. Um, the most common pathway of ending up with, uh, you know, a typed buffer is just to, to use this um, reader function and then specify the type here. So here we give it a, a persistent vector like we did with the as buffer call, but we say uh, this is an int32. And in this case, you know, it still looks the same. We look at it, it's an int32. Uh, uh, buffer and um, and you can see also all the types that are available here. A uh, quick so. question. Mm -hmm. uh, may I ask uh, the uh, so the, the those keywords? Uh, yeah, uh, they are telling you they are they are their labels to tell you that uh, this is the lowest primitive, uh, meaning the most performant primitive that uh, D type works with is that correct or uh i'm not sure i totally so can for you example, ask the question you... one more time yeah sure sure sorry uh, so for example when you you uh create the end array uh a little higher up 
you're telling Clojure, uh, give me an array of boxed java.lang.integers, which are then passed, which is then passed to dtype as buffer. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the element-wise data type ends up being a, uh, a uh, int, mm -hmm. uh, int32 uh, mm -hmm. keyword. So mm -hmm. my question is the int32 keyword tells me that I am. I, uh, the elements of this uh, buffer are the most efficient, the ones that the type can work with the best, the, more, the, the fastest. Is that correct, or you mean it, as opposed uh, to in, in sixty four or something? Uh, well, no. Uh, what I mean is as opposed to uh, Java dot length dot integer. Oh, I see. Uh, so actually, what's kind of happening here, and this is part of the type next uh, 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 typing system is that there's a kind of aliasing going on uh, behind the scenes you know you don't need to deal with this when you're working with detail naps but there's a kind of mapping of these keywords to the to the uh, the class names so uh, the fact that it shows up as keywords is just you know uh, maybe a kind of convenience I think right. you know to make working with d type next feel like working with a closure library as opposed to kind of needing to be aware of uh you know the hosting on the jvm okay. does that answer your question uh, yeah i think so thank you yeah yeah so um right so suddenly we started talking about that we've seen this for a while but you know it deserves some discussion so we were talking about buffers and then now I'm saying the main function you're going to end up using is arrow reader. So the, it stands to, you know, it's a fair question, you know, what is, what is a reader? <laughs> uh, and, and basically um, in D type next, we have buffers of two types. We have reader buffers and writer buffers. Um, a reader buffer just means that you can read values from it. So pretty much every buffer that's going to be of any value to you is going to be a reader because otherwise you wouldn't be able to look at the values that it um, represents. Um, on the other hand, writer buffers are comparatively rare. Uh, you don't work with them very much. A writer buffer is a, is a buffer that you can mutate. Uh, and, you know, in Clojure, we often don't like to mutate uh, things and 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 so you know the when you would you wouldn't reach for a writer very frequently but uh, and 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 part of you know the effort is to make D type next per performant enough that you don't need to uh, uh, but there are cases as many of you know who work with may know who work with data that you know when you're talking about really large amounts of data uh, there are times when cop you know uh, doing copy or you know uh, working with something that you can't mutate isn't isn't realistic or efficient, and so you can make writable buffers where you can mutate the values. And we can you know, just sort of see how that works here. There's this function called set value, and if we start with a reader uh, and then try to in the here this expression would set the 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 you know the middle you know, the first position or index one to zero, and this will give us an error. Uh, and and uh, I think uh, Jeff, that's the error you may have run into. And they're uh, actually, yeah. So it's in other words, didactic in the sense that we meant that error to occur uh, to show that you can't you can't write to a reader. Um, on the other hand, if we if we start with if we get we get ourselves a, a writer, um, and in this case we need. Um, uh, something that has concrete storage. We'll start with an interay, and we'll come back to that issue of concreteness in a second. Uh, but you know, something has to have a exist in memory in order to be changed. So he, we can here you'll see we can we can set that middle value uh, as we want. So yeah, that's the difference between readers and writers. Uh, and yeah. Uh, just looking at the time. Yeah, I should probably keep going and then we can stop after this um, uh, and maybe even take a break. Uh, but uh, so the last bit here is in some ways the most uh, potentially surprising or curious part of D-Type Next. 
Uh, and it's the property of readers that they are lazy and non-caching. So, um, and here we're gonna, it's, in this example, we use a, a yet another way of uh, describing um, a, a buffer or a reader that that is um, particularly illustrative of this. So you can, with dtype next, you can also describe a reader in a way that where it's, it's I don't know, to put it like nicely, it's sort of just an idea. Right. So when we're creating this reader up here, it's like, okay, we've got ourselves a vector and we just want to make it a reader. But here, what we're doing is we're saying, we're going to make a reader. This reader is going to be an int 64. It's going to have a million elements and each position will be calculated with this expression. The index here is a special value that only this is this function make reader is a template and so this is I think the phrase is a I was taught this by my co uh, workshop creator David Sletton this is I think an anaphora which is a concept from linguistics kind of like if I say um, uh, you know where's my cup and somebody responds it's on the table the it's in that it has only meaning in that context. So similarly, this index only has meaning in the context of this uh, make reader template, which gives this index the meaning of basically each position for, you know, when, if I, if I take, if I try to read the value of this reader that I'm going to create at position zero, index will be zero. And so the result of this expression would be zero times whatever random integer comes out of this function here. So what may be becoming clear to you in my description is that this is not a thing that actually exists in memory. It's just an idea of a buffer. And so I can create this, this big reader in this case, and I can take five elements and there we have the first five values. But, and this is a bit of a trumped up example, notice that there was a random integer there. If I evaluate this again, I get different numbers, in fact, every time. And that's because readers uh, are non-caching. Uh, um, and of course, they're also lazy, right? Like I'm only taking five, so it's only calculating the first five. And similarly, if I, if I wanna read some position in the, in the buffer I, that's towards the end, it's not gonna calculate the whole thing, I'm just gonna take those five. Uh, at the you know position nine hundred ninety nine thousand, uh, so uh, yeah. So this is what we mean when we say readers are lazy and non caching Now there, are, and and this, uh, you know, this, if your minds may be spinning, this offers a lot of power uh, in more advanced cases. You can imagine that you can express. Uh, complicated ideas within really large scale without needing to take up memory. And that, that's very powerful. It also means that you can declare, um, you know, the laziness part means that you can declare, uh, you can sort of delay as you can with laziness. And generally you can, you can explain, you can describe a transformation before executing it. And then, you know, this just offers a, a, a broader range of, uh, you know, tools when you're working with large amounts of data and you want to work with them in memory. And, uh, and it sets dtype next apart from other libraries in the space. Uh, uh, you know, I don't know NumPy well, but this, I don't think this is part of its default behavior. And I know, um, and so, you know, in case, in some cases, this can be, allow you to uh, uh, deal with things um, more efficiently uh, and in memory than you could in other things with other libraries. Um, what you can do though, is let's say you're working with a buffer that is you know, non-caching, but you need to make it concrete. You need to give it some backing by storage and memory, maybe because you wanna create, make it into a writer uh, and mutate it, or because you need it to be consistent. It somehow you know, could evaluate differently each time. So we can, we can do that by realizing a buffer. And there's a couple of ways of doing that. One is you can call this make container function, which will essentially give um, uh, the reader storage. Containers are kind of like the, the other concept in dtype next. They, they are uh, essentially uh, entities with storage. 
with memory storage. And they can have different kinds of storage, uh, but you can also just sort of let dtype next decide what to do. Um, and, and the other function is dtype clone. Uh, both of those will give you a concrete buffer. So if we execute this, we have now a realized buffer. And if I execute this multiple times, I'm going to get the same values. Uh, and I think it, it can also be useful to look at how this looks. So a realized, uh, oh, that's, yeah. Um, real, yeah, so if we look at this, it, it now has the class array buffer. Uh, and this is the, class you'll see when this thing is, when, when a buffer has been realized. Um, yeah, so we've gotten through uh, the first two sections um, and uh, there's two more, uh, but I think, uh, you know, we customarily try to take a break in the middle of the workshop to give people uh, a chance to, uh, decompress and maybe think of questions. Uh, but before we do that, uh, are, are there any questions pertaining to the first two parts that people would like to talk about? Um, then we, if, if not, we can take a break, but I just want to take a few moments to see if anyone has any questions before we move on. Okay, so we're back after a short break. Um, we have just finished uh, going over the uh, buffer basic concepts. And so now we're gonna show in this third section here, what it's like to work with buffers. Um, uh, so one thing that it, you know, useful to kind of explain off the bat is that, um, you know, we, in the beginning we saw that uh, we could, uh, um, you know, that when we printed a, a buffer, it looked a lot like a closure vector. And, and that's because it implements some of the same um, uh, interfaces that are necessary. So, you know, from the point of view of the, uh, um, the closure reader and the REPL, it, 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 it's understandable in those terms. Uh, but uh, in another direction, that's also true uh, in terms of the, the interface between uh, dtype next and its, and its structures and, uh, and closure functions, uh, that you can use uh, closure functions that make sense with dtype next buffers. So for example, we, and we saw this in the beginning, well, actually we didn't, sorry. Uh, uh, I can reduce like I did in the beginning over a regular closure, um, vector or range in that case over I can I can reduce over a dtype next buffer reader buffer so here we're doing just that we're reducing over the reader and um, and this will you know this will run and really quickly but right this isn't as efficient uh, as you can imagine now things get reboxed at some point um, uh, and you know uh, Here's another case where we'll just keep only the uh, the odd values, right? Um, but one thing, to, and you know, we can count. Uh, but one thing to keep in mind when we're doing this, in addition to the possible uh, performance hits, is that we also kind of leave uh, uh, the dtype next world. So if I look at the result of that keep expression from just above, now we see that we've got a lazy sequence. Um, because that's what that function returns. And so, you know, we're kind of, it, it's not just the performance hit, but also uh, when, when we start using uh, regular closure functions on, on these buffers, we realize that we sort of get pulled out of dtype next world and that, you know, it's not that you can't make up for that. Uh, you can convert things back, but there's performance hits and also extra bookkeeping. Um, so a lot of the time, and this is where we finally come to that functional namespace that I was talking about at the very beginning. Uh, we, we end up, when we're doing processing over buffers, we use uh, this namespace and a few others that provide functions that are designed specifically to work with um, closure buffers. And so uh, they have all the optimizations you need and they return buffers. Uh, so there's a whole lot of functions in this, in this namespace, as we can see here, right? A lot of mathematical expressions. And, and here, I don't know if you remember, but when we first looked at the repository, uh, one other thing that 
that Chris said there is that the the library provides a um, you know array processing expressiveness similar to APL or NumPy. And here, these are functions that allow you to be expressive about, for example, adding or subtracting entire arrays or buffers, rather than needing to write, write some sort of extra code that you know performs that like by you know mapping or something like that. Uh, so um, let's we can take a look at this. We create two buffers A and B, uh, and we can we can see that I can actually just subtract the two. So A was you know this concrete uh, 20, 30, 40, 50, and this and B is just is created from a range expression. Um, so if I do that subtraction, it, it works. Right, so I subtracted, I subtracted zero from 20, one from 30, so on and so forth. Uh, we can also do it with scalars. I can just subtract two from the from all of the values in A. And uh, yes. Oh, sorry uh, to interrupt. Uh, I hope I'm not asking you to repeat yourself. Maybe I, I missed it, but this is very cool, this parallel. Uh, 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 Element wise operation, I wanted to ask you: Are those done in parallel? Uh, sorry, I missed the. What did you say? I, I, are they? Uh, uh, would you say that if the? I guess it depends on the number of uh, what your hardware is, but uh, fun uh, the, the the fun dash minus a b. Mm -hmm. uh, does it adapt to uh, massively programming a, a parallel hardware, for example, a GP GPU? Yeah, I think or it has. Is, a, is it something yeah. you need to? Uh, or and uh, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Yes. So the answer is yes, it does. Uh, I don't know exactly what's necessary to if there's some sort of configuration or some other thing needs to happen for that to work. I've never done it myself, but it does. Right. These these functions do kind of parallelize the process and um, and then can take advantage of hardware uh, uh, tools that are available. Um, do you think they, they do that automatically uh, looking let's say at your number of cores let's say if, if you if your uh, laptop has uh, four or eight cores do they do they <laughs> leverage that automatically or uh, or not that's a it's a good question um, I'm gonna write that down I actually don't know because it still hasn't come up for me uh, could I but... jump in for a second sure yeah oh is this is Chris hi Chris yeah hey um so real quick those functional functions so fun minus uh in this example it doesn't do anything it just creates another reader it doesn't parallelize it doesn't even create a result it just creates a reader that upon read of each item does the operation okay and if it knows that for instance a is a double container uh, and b is any number then mm -hmm. it will do it in a double space without boxing so it'll we'll create another virtual interface that does that operation upon request. The parallelization happens when you say something like clone or copy. Mm -hmm. ah, In okay. that case, it realizes all the results or some. In mm -hmm. that case, it realizes whatever chain of operations you have. And the, yeah, so it's slightly different. It does not do a GP GPU conversion or something like that. It just creates a lazy interface that'll do what you ask upon request. So it, it, you could do the same with reify reader expression, and mm -hmm. it should have about the same performance, assuming you type out things correctly. I see. And then in terms of the hardware, will it, if, if you have a GPU available? No, when you, you would clone? have to manually transform the data to Neanderthal. I see. OK. Because um, that's all. And the fact yep. that uh, this library is specializes in standardizing interfacing with uh, libraries like Neanderthal makes it especially valuable to work with if you wanted to leverage that, right? That's what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. And that's why, it's, incidentally, that's why the keywords, that's why the types are keywords and not Java types. Because uh, there is no Java unsigned 32 int type. And okay. there is no Java unsigned byte type. But those are types you work with all the time in data science because it's mm -hmm. every image ever, you know. Right. So I chose keywords. You can read them; they're easy. It's easy to extend. 
So it wasn't just a convenience thing about uh, making it feel like closure. No, it was because I needed another symbol to represent types that could not be represented upon the JVM period. And so uh -huh. a primitive unsigned byte type cannot be represented on the JVM natively. There is no JVM class you could write that would map to that. Mm -hmm. And keywords are a very nice way to express anything. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, you're welcome. All right. So, um, yeah. And then, uh, yeah, and as you can see, like here, if I if I look at the kind of entity that's returned by uh, uh, by the uh, the the functional expression, the minus, it's we're still working with a buffer. And I guess from what Chris was just saying, this is this new buffer that if realized would would process those the, uh, those values. And here's just some other expressions, raising something to a power, taking a log. Um, another kind of property that emerges when you're working with multiple buffers uh, that's typical of uh, these kinds of libraries is that if we're working with um, entities of different types, it will upcast. It'll pick the most detailed type. So if I have ints and floats, two buffers, uh, and I look at, you know, I can see that those are what, that's what I have. When I do a uh, multiplication, for example, of those two, I end up with floats because we don't want to lose that information. Um, uh, you can see that that's the case here. Uh, D-type next provides some uh, tools for mapping. So in, if you don't want to, if you need to do a map, but you don't want to use the closure map, which would introduce performance hits, uh, you can use emap. Uh, and so this function allows you to, it's, you know, it looks a lot like map, except that we specify the type here. And it allows you to do custom things. In this case, we will create uh, uh, you know, a buffer of zeros, or here just do some random calculation on the range, adding a tenth of the value to each position. Um, uh, we can subset the buffer. So we saw this before uh, at the top, but you can take a segment of the buffer. Um, now here uh, we can also take the, we're gonna do, this is a kind of a, a more uh, advanced example um, where we're gonna sort of, we're gonna operate an index space. So, um, what we can do is let's say we need to to get we want to filter only the odd values from from a, buff, a buffer so we can get you know uh using a functional this function this odd function from the functional namespace we can get you know a, a, a logical buffer that contains you know in each position and boolean that indicates whether or not the value is odd but let's say we want to filter those out and grab only the odd so now we need to use an, another namespace uh, that uh, is called arg ops and gives us in particular a function called arg filter that will return the index positions that match the predicate. So um, here we'll, we're, we're going to look for all the odd values and we're gonna get the index values. And so here it tells us those index positions. It's the same ones. That here, it, coincidentally, because I use the range, it's the same, you know, the index positions are the same as the actual values, but these are, so it's a little bit confusing, but these are the indices for the odd, uh, odd values. And then in this expression, so it's a little more involved, we can, we'll, we'll generate, so here's our reader, like above. Here we use the argops filter, or sorry, the arg filter function to get those indices, just like I did above. And then in one additional step, we take, we use this function index buffer to return a new buffer that only contains the indices that we've specified. So this will give us a new buffer just with those, those indices. And so as you can imagine, you can use this to filter, uh, to very efficiently filter uh, a buffer um, based on some sort of calcul you know, predicate. Um, yeah. So. Uh, th that's that's the end of this uh, 
this section. Is there, are there any other, uh, are there any questions at this point? Is there a way to do the, these two steps in one step when you get the indices and then you immediately get, so uh, rather you, you have a predicate and you immediately get filtered. Um, there, there's, you mean like in terms of uh, like a function that would just right. do that all at once? Yeah. Uh, not to my knowledge uh, right now. Uh, maybe Chris knows more. Or if, am I wrong about that, Chris? Uh, no, that's correct. Um, yeah. The the reason that they're two separate functions is because when you the the half the point of working an in index space like this is so you could apply those integers to a second buffer mm. or potentially to every other column in the data set. Mm -hmm. so when you say and that's that, where you get a lot of power from this form of uh, expressing yep. transformation. It's a form of abstraction that allows you to not have row wise data to be really precise about it. Because now right. I can store each property in a column and I can operate on one column and, and affect every other column just in the next space. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, is that, that called broadcasting? Sense. Actually, is that no uh, broadcasting no, is when no, you take a buffer that is small of smaller dimension or a tensor of smaller dimensions and ah, okay. duplicate elements till it matches some larger tensor. I see. Yeah, this this little idea is uh, uh, this little piece here of the code is one of the things that, as I was working on this workshop, uh, interested in me most. And I was I've actually been thinking of trying to do kind of like a fo more focus on that to kind of show what you're just you were talking about, Chris. Uh, I think it would be really interesting because it's also one of these things where it's this con conceptual uh, tool that is available in other languages. Uh, it is, is it Mat and MATLAB or whatever that where it's kind of very normal way of working. Is that the one? Yeah, because well, like one way that I've used it, the the way that I first used these sort of functions that are started prefixed with arg is doing what's called uh, non-maximal suppression with neural nets, where the neural net essentially guesses lots and lots of answers, and you want to suppress all the answers that don't meet a criteria. And so you basically calculate one double buffer of your criteria, which is could be a distance function or a lot of other things. So I'm going to have to go for Zoom. Uh, but, or I the kid. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to mute in a second. But uh, you calculate that buffer, and then you use arg sort on it. And that gives you sorted indices, and then you take the top n of those indices. And then you reapply those indices to your original buffer, and you end up with the five top things of your sample batch or whatever that you're going to actually calculate your errors from. Mm. Yeah, this sounds like a really, maybe we'll have to think if there's a way to create a workshop around that or, or some simple version of it. Um, could be really cool, I think, to see. Um, are there any other questions at this stage? Real quick, as you, as I said, you see it every time you use the data set library. <laughs> so in, mm -hmm. in NumPy, sure. I wasn't using pandas in the back end of the neural net, but I guess I could have been, and it would have mm -hmm. kind of done this automatically. But this is where I would just now at this point, I would calculate the result as an extra column in the data set and just do top in or sort the data set. Mm -hmm. Right. Any other questions? No? Okay. So uh, th at this point, we're going to go through just a small uh, exercise that kind of looks at real data. Uh, um, yeah, just to kind of show some of these pieces working together. So we'll start with this, you know, very famous iris data set. Um, and we'll look at what we're going to do is we're going to create a normalized form of the sepal length, uh, which is the, you know, outside of the, the leaf. Uh, and um, so we're going to, the normalization would cast all those values somewhere between zero and one. Um, and so we'll read in the data and then we're just going to use some regular closure uh, tools to, to uh, um, grab the data and to you know, re, uh, read it. Uh, and later we'll show you how you might do that in, in a way that's more convenient with the tools that we have building in this, tech, uh, this uh, data science stack. Uh, 
So yeah, we can see this is what the data looks like. We end up with a, a, a you know a, a, a list of uh, or a sequence of, of vectors, and it's that first value in each that we're interested in. And as you can see, there's strings. So uh, we'll you know what we'll do here to begin with is just sort of parse you know turn them into numbers or floats to be specific. So. We're going to take the data, we'll, we'll convert it to a vector because uh, that you need a vector to, to map over. Uh, EMAP doesn't work with the um, uh, lazy sequence. And uh, we're going to do two passes just for convenience. So first we'll just get the boxed values, uh, not worrying about what what's what's inside so we'll just take the first I suppose this could be you know a character of some sort um, but uh, and then in the next pass we'll parse this those strings into floats so if I do that it runs and we can take the first five values and we can see that you know because of the uh, vagaries of floating point numbers we don't get exactly 5.1 for example for that first value uh, and then our calculation is really simple. It's just we'll take, we'll use again another function in, in the functional namespace to take the, get the min and the max from the data, and then we will divide the difference between the actual value in each position. So the, you know this is running over every position, every value. So here what we're doing essentially is this is a vector and this is a scalar, and so we're subtracting whatever value is in each position. Uh, or sorry, uh, uh, we're from the, uh, the and we're extracting the min from it. So we get the extent of the, the difference off the minimum, and then we divide that by the extent of the difference. Uh, and, and this gives us that normalization. Now let's try to run this. So we got an error here. And does, does anyone want to venture a guess why? So it says that we got an empty string. And, and uh, we can see. Yeah, you cannot you know. parse a number out of an empty string, I guess. Right. And so somewhere in there, there was an empty string. But why didn't we see that here? Why? Well, because the, the 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 error occurs later in the data set. I, right. I, and I, because the buffer is lazy. Ah, uh, that's true. Right. Exactly. So this is just one of those uh, examples of you know where where the. Uh, you know, you're seeing the, the sort of unique properties of D-type next buffers. Uh, um, so yeah, let's say we'll we'll try to deal with this. We, we get our bad data. We'll just skip the step of parsing to begin with, and then we can look using that arg filter function again, just for convenience. Where where is that empty string? So here we're just using a predicate that looks for an empty string, and it finds one at position 150. So uh, no wonder we didn't see it when we took five. So we can clean that, and to do it, we'll use that same arg filter function. Um, and uh, uh, in, in this case, um, we're gonna, you know, pull out all the values that are, uh, you know, not. We want ones that are not empty strings. So we're gonna we'll, we'll select those values, um, and create a buffer that is only consisting of strings that are not empty. And then if we recreate some our data with this time with the cleaning in, in between, uh, we should look and see that there's no empty values. And we should be able to run our expression. So it ran, we got our normalized data. You can see that these are a bunch of values between zero and one, and we can even validate that it's true. So here we'll just use another function, concat buffers. We'll push these two, uh, uh, so what we'll do is, sorry, we'll start at the bottom. We'll take a, we'll look for a, um, uh, we'll check to see whether there are any values that are over one, which because we wouldn't want that, or any that are under zero, which we wouldn't want to, that would mean that our normalization wasn't correct. And then we'll put them together and then convert them to ints, meaning, it's they're boolean. It's, you end up with a boolean expression, but it should be uh, zero for false and uh, one for true. And what we want is both all of the no. We want no trues, and so our and then we'll finally sum them together, and we should end up with a zero, which would mean that none of the values you know 
were outside of the bounds we just described there. So that's uh, you know just a simple, uh, somewhat trumped up, but slightly more realistic example of uh, using dtype next to manipulate uh, some data. Uh, um, and are there any questions at this stage? Okay, so um, one last um, section here, and then we can stop and sort of talk more if, we, if there are more questions. Um, is this is just a kind of illustration of, you know, you'll remember in the beginning I said that the that um, D type next constitutes the columns uh, within TechML dataset, and so here we can kind of just look at the same data that we were looking at before uh, just now this iris data, but using TechML data set. So this is the require statement for TechML data set. Um, takes a little bit longer to load. Uh, and here we can actually use, so you know, unlike above here where we use some like more raw or low level closure functions to, to, to pull in the data, TechML data set has some convenient functions that allow you just to read from uh, read direct, more directly and get return a data set. So here we're providing the same URL for that iris data. And if I run it, uh, we'll get an error now because and this is just didactic again. So the data URL, if you remember, had dot was dot data at the end. And, and so, you know, this function doesn't know what that means. It, it wants to, it uses the file extension to try to determine what kind of file it is. Uh, so here we can give it a hint. We'll say this is a CSV file because it is. And now we get, you can see we have a data set, uh, which uh, in this case has a first column, which looks like some data. And that's because there's no headers in this file. So we'll, we'll again, give it another hint and tell it that the header row doesn't exist. And now it gives us some trumped up you know, column names that sort of make sense anyways, uh, and, and the data is correct. Um, so now uh, let's pack that into a variable uh, and we can take a look at it again, it's there. Now, just to kind of illustrate, we can, we can the, the sort of interop in a way between dtype next and uh, 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 TechML data set is actually, I want to show one thing first here. If I look at this, uh, um, oh, actually, what well, I no, do, uh, just going to pull out the column here. Um, oops, sorry. Um, so you can see here that this thing identifies as a column, but what I can, I can actually convert this column, not that I initially want to, into a reader. So there's this kind of interop, right? Um, and uh, so you know I can you know and I can run functions on this, like I would this reader. So this sepal variable now holds a reader. Uh, and if I look at sepal, right, it looks like familiar where we saw that, you know, this is, uh, oh, that's funny, it says object there, I'm not sure why. Um, but uh, but the, perhaps more importantly, even though I'm working with something that in the TechML data set world is known as a column, um, I can call these functions right on the column itself. I don't need to convert it to a dtype next reader buffer. Uh, so, you know, here I can, you know, look at the, the data type um, and, uh, you know, down here I can add values to it or, uh, and so, so here I'm adding it to a reader, but here I'm adding it to the, to the column and you get the same result. So there's this kind of, you know, uh, uh, fluidity and interop, if it's probably not quite the right word to say, between um, D type next and TechML dataset columns because they're based on uh, D type next, and uh, and you know so all of these functions and that all important functional namespace will work on columns. 
Um, and just as a last thing, if we look at the data member of a column, you would probably never do this. It's, it, you know, we see that array buffer that we saw before when we, when we realized the, uh, the, the, the D type next reader. So there's this, uh, you know, inside the column, it's, a, it's related tightly to um, D type next buffers. Uh, and yeah, that, that wraps up the workshop. Um, this last bit was just to kind of show you that connection into the broader stack uh, after having looked a little bit more deeply at uh, D-Type Next itself. Uh, and, I have, a, I have a, a quick question. Would you be able to, just to illustrate the uh, translation from uh, row format to column format, uh, show, uh, or maybe reuse one of the examples and show us again uh, what a, uh, let's say, a, um, uh, a table that is in uh, uh, in D type dot next and uh, in row format and then show the the column format in the uh, tech TMD uh, namespace. Uh, I don't know that my question is clear. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to. So you're saying uh, basically is yeah. that. Uh, uh, you're saying uh, that uh, TMD TechML data set uh, um, uh, will uh, give you column views, column projections of uh, of your data, uh, and you have retrieved yeah. data for what that is in the CSV format. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I see. They, they they will both look the same, whether it's in D type dot next, but the the, t the tech ML data set uh, will show you column headers and you'll be able to invoke no column numbers as opposed to the type that next where you want. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. So uh, I'm not sure this would work actually. Is this kind of what you're. Oh, that doesn't work. Well, for um, example. Or, or, huh? or, Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. yeah no, so, no, so basically that's what I was trying to say. Uh, but maybe if you use the D type next, if you show us the same data in the D, in the D type next uh, format, quote unquote, and in the tech ML dataset format, for example, just to see a comparison. Right. Okay. So uh, yeah, yeah. I, maybe this last section was a little unclear. So this sepal variable, um, uh, uh, this is a. Uh, um, I look at this. Right. Was a this reader? was a reader, right? It, it uh, and I, and I, and if you remember, I'll show it in a second, but I, I created it. Uh, um, it's funny. Yeah. I, I don't know why that is reporting as object in this case, uh, but, but it's a um, D type next uh, world. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is, yeah. And, and, and I created it, if you may remember by right here. I so I converted it to a reader. Ah, uh, okay, okay, okay. And, and maybe the reason I'm getting an object there has something to do with the pathway that is happening when I convert a column. But this is sort of a, a uh, this was just meant to be sort of illustrative. Oh yeah, yeah, of, yeah actually, of the yeah, interoperability. Yeah. But you probably wouldn't ever need to do this because yeah, right. I can operate on the column the same way I can operate on a reader. Okay. It, okay. It, it, yeah, it, it, the, the point this. that I was trying to make here is just to show, is to try to illustrate that D type next is at the bottom of TechML data set, or that it's, you know, that the columns are sort of rooted in that, in this library. And so, and this is, and that you can use the D type next, uh, uh, processing functions with columns um okay and and in fact you will do that uh uh in most cases um so yeah so that's what this was meant to kind of didactically illustrate but i think the yeah there's you know some there's some additional complexity there uh, around like that conversion that i don't totally understand um uh, 
Does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, we can look I, at it probably I, I from another way to, too. Yeah, yeah, I think I just need to play with the code and uh, uh, do it for myself and I will see clearer. Thank you. Yeah. Great presentation. So the, the thing is like when you're working on with, with TechML data set, uh, you would in most cases not think about dtype next. In practice, the, uh, the most common case where you would think about dtype next is you would do, you know, you would want to do some sort of processing on the column and then you would just, you know, import uh, functional this namespace. Maybe uh, there's a, you know, a few others you can end up using and then, you, you know, and then you would um, uh, do the kind of, you know, do some sort of expressions like this and you would, but you would be operating on a column. Uh, yeah. uh, so, we, sorry, go ahead. Mm -hmm. So it, I just kind of, I think one of the main benefits of this workshop, uh, at least for me actually in prepping it was this, this was the case is that um, is not so much that you might, it, it, you would reach for D type next itself, uh, in order to solve a problem, unless you know it was something very specific about you know wanting that kind of low-level control um, and and operating on you know individual sequences of data, uh, or um, and we kind of didn't go into that in this workshop, but there's also it kind of also has some tensor functions that work with these things too, uh, or a tensor structure that works with these these uh, processing functions as well. But you would be working with um, TechML data set. And so I think, but I think that in my experience with when you're working with TechML data set, understanding that DType Next is there at the bottom and that, um, and that you can draw on some of these concepts we've learned here to understand what's going on and manipulate the columns there and understand how they are going to be processed um, uh, is, is really helpful. Okay. Would you say that, uh, uh, well, you, you mentioned earlier, uh, uh, I think that uh, DType Next is equivalent to NumPy in the pen, Python world and uh, uh, TechML data set to Pandas? Right, yeah, that's that's a rough analogy, yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I was wondering, uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with other libraries, but I've got books mm -hmm. on them. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so, and I know uh, this library is pretty new and there is not that much literature on it. Uh, so would you say with a good idea to get more familiar with the concepts would be to read through some NumPy documentation and exercises and pandas and then apply them, try to do the same thing in uh, the type next and uh, ML data set, would you say? Would, be, would Is that, do you think a good approach? Uh, um, if I wanted mean, to get more fluent. Yeah, I think, I mean, for one thing, I should mention that the, the, the resource, uh, uh, the, you know, Zulip is an, was a wonderful resource uh, if you have live questions. You're right that there isn't as much uh, stuff that's available. And it, I mean, um, you know, there aren't like written texts, too many written texts yet. There's the resources inside the um, you know, the Chris, that Chris has written, uh, those, you know, uh, the overview and the cheat sheet that I referred to in the beginning, those are really useful, okay. especially on a conceptual level. Um, and then, yes, it, you know, I think what you mentioned at the end, actually, uh, I'll, re I'll share a different screen here, because I wanted to mention also for, you know, digging in more deeply, it can be useful to, if I can find the right, there it is. Yes. Uh, there's what one of the things that I found when I was generating this workshop was actually um, this kind of interesting oh. 100, 101 NumPy exercises for data analysis. So this is kind of like exactly what you were describing, I think. I will, I will dig into that. Thank you yeah, very there, much. Yeah, there aren't actually 101 here, but what's nice about this is it has the you know, it has the goal, right? And then it shows you so the solution in NumPy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so a really good way to understand the differences between these two libraries is to try to recreate these in, in, um, 
uh, with the with the DTEP next. And I would uh, just suggest that when you do that, it, you know, anytime you run into any kind of questions um, or blocks or whatever, uh, is to you know, in combination with Zulip, reach out there in in the data science thread or whatever, and ask because somebody will be able to help you out. And in many cases, you know, th these libraries, as you said, are also still new, and so there's a lot of um, you know, raising those kind of questions leads to improvements of the library. Cool. Thank you. I had a question uh, re earlier that I, I think I probably the answer is probably no, but is, is this library liberate, um, related to uh, CLG Python that Chris wrote a few years ago? Is that uh, probably not, but uh, he, he wrote a library that allows you to invoke Python run in, in, in uh, I think inside a Python engine. I'm not sure, but uh, uh, the, like yes, Python. yes, yeah. You can they are. Speak to that. Yeah, go ahead. yeah. So that gets into the very first statement I wanted to to add a little bit of color to, where I said it unifies continuous processing. I didn't say the domain that it unified. Mm -hmm. And so, kind of, Ethan found a domain that it it definitely does unify processing, but the, the, the domains it unified first was that I can create a native heap buffer that's contiguous and I can create a JVM heap buffer. The navy and native heap buffer, you can literally get an integer pointer from. You can get like the integer pointer that you could then pass into C with. Mm -hmm. And so this dtype next, in addition to everything that he talked about, dtype next defines a foreign function interface for working with C, dynamically loading C shared libraries. And um, libpython CLJ is built on top of that FFI, that foreign function interface. Ah, okay. Ah, okay. So yep. that, that, and then, that, mm -hmm, go ahead. And then uh, a side effect of all of that, and this is the important bit that doesn't happen without some foresight, is that you can take, for instance, a NumPy array, multi-dimensional array, and you, with zero copy, you can literally get the C pointer to it, and you can create a dtype next tensor, which is the ND buffer abstraction in dtype next, without copying anything. That's so you great. can write or wow. read from the exact buffer that the NumPy data is based on top of. Which, so no time wasted in translation whatsoever. Unless you want to, if you want to have a JVM key hmm. buffer for some reason, then you can copy it, and that copy operation should you choose to do it, is also in a very highly optimized operation. I use like one mem copy call under the covers, literally mem copy. So, um, so even if you do choose to copy when you want to, then you get the you basically do the whole zero copy pathway and then you say clone, and that does an optimized copy to to the JVM. So they're they're linked, both in the fact that the FFI sub the FFI module in dtype next is used to implement the actual FFI bindings in the Python CLJ, but they're also linked in that there's a zero copy pathway to the ND type in dtype next to the ND type that's used in Python. And this is also true of Julia. Hmm. So it has the same kind capabilities of to Julia, where you can take a Julia array, as long as it's a dense array that Julia has many different types of arrays that aren't, you know, a contiguous memory, but as long as it's a, it's a Julia ND array that's based off a contiguous buffer of memory, you can zero copy it and you, you can get a reference to it in Java and, and manipulate it on their covers in Java. Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, You're I, welcome. I, was, I, I had one, one, one last question. I hope I'm not abusing too much your time. No, no we have time. This is the time for discussion. I, so. I was wondering if uh, just to give us a, not a survey, but just a, a, an example of a project uh, which does use the FFI and where you have done some high flying hmm. production or some some uh, interesting stuff uh, uh, in the closure world, thanks to to these two libraries. Yeah. So um, there's a library that I use called AVCLJ, which is low level bindings to um, the the libraries that underpin FFmpeg, which are AV codec and AV format and AV this and AV that. There's like six of them. So uh, that uses the G-type FFI to 
to so that you can bind to those libraries. And the thing about the way that FFI system is specified is it's got backend. So one backend is JNA, and another backend is Graal native, and a third backend is another form of Graal native where you can compile Clojure into a shared library itself. Mm. And so that that library AVCLJ shows each one of those done in order. Wow. Um, so in terms of like learning how the FFI interface works, AVCLJ is a very dense way that shows almost everything aside from callbacks from Python back into Java, which are a little hairy because I tried to translate through so many different FFI languages that are available on the JVM. But aside from callbacks, AVCLJ shows everything. And it definitely will get you started on any project, I think. I mean, if it doesn't, it's my, my fault and we should improve the documentation. So, so you're saying that the, your AVCLJ project, which is probably on GitHub, is a good way to get introduced uh, to the details of working with FFI? Yes. Okay, great. Yep, and there's there's some assumptions there that um, I'll be interested. I mean, it's uh, it's definitely not a, a, a section of D-type next. I've put a whole ton of effort into making um, super user accessible, but I have written examples and there are people in the community who've written other things based off of it. There's only a few of us though. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for uh, the information and looking forward to learn more about, about the library and thanks for a great presentation. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Chris. Uh, I Also, I think that I don't know how much it gets into the foreign function interface, but uh, James, I'm forgetting his last name right now, uh, uh, is a guy in the community named James who re gave recently a workshop on interop. Uh, so I'm pasting that into the, you know, the, the thread too, in case it's useful. Um, are there any other questions? What about you, Ray? Have you uh, any thoughts, things that didn't make sense? Not to put you on the spot, but if you if you have anything. Um, this is uh, this is all new to me, but this is uh, very good. I think uh, I think I understand how I can uh, start using this. Of course, uh, basically um, starting from scratch, but uh, just like something I want to get into. <laughs> Great. Great. Yeah, and like I said, you know, yeah, feel free to reach out on Zulu. Um, there's a lot, there's a lot of nice people there uh, who will be responsive to any questions you have. Yeah, um, thank you. That was a, that was a great uh, presentation. Okay. All right. So, looks like. Um, are, are there any more questions or comments? Okay, well, thank you, Ethan. Thank you so much. That was- My pleasure. Uh, really, uh, yeah, it's a story. <laughs> it was interesting yeah. to hear the story. Um, and thank yeah. you, Chris, um, and thank you, for Chris. the library and for yeah. being here and answering yeah. questions. Um, and thanks to everybody who attended.